But if you know how folds pinch and how they work like it, it can give you a lot of perspective. You know, part of this practice is not just the mark making itself, but understanding, getting more exposure to the underlying uh, things that you're reproducing, anatomy, clothing folds, clouds, hair, whatever. And learning them gives you uh, the ability to replicate them from imagination. And also gives you more ability to replicate them, you know, from reference. See, let's take a look at, um, let's take a look real quick at what we got going on here. Okay. I'm going to do this, this last arm real quick. And then we're going to take a look at what this layer looks like overall. And closer we can see the position on the thumb better. Almost invisible inside the shadow. Since the fingers are silhouetted like this and fairly linear, it's pretty easy to push them around and reposition them. Just kind of erasing out where the old ones are and then smashing in some new ones. One at a time. There we go. And then this represents like the thumb and when there's like a little highlight across the tip of it, give it a little bit of definition. So now you can see on our latest layer here, we go from this to this. And now, now we're starting to cook. Now we're cooking. So I've got a couple of things I can move forwards with. Um, number one is I sometimes like to add a little bit of color at this stage when I have like rough, uh, rough values. I'll do that, start that process often through something like a gradient map where I'll throw a gradient map over the top of it and change it to soft light, which is, I guess, a slightly more advanced process. But you can see how um, the grayscale is starting to gain a little bit of additional color. There's these bands of color that are showing up. This is, uh, this is emulating a little bit about how um, color changes temperature when it goes from like light into shadow. Like, I'm going to push this blue down here a little bit. And you can see how if we get it lined up kind of with where the values are, the shadows start to get bluish while the highlights, the space near the highlights starts to get orangish. And that's actually what's happening. Whoopsie, whatever happened there. I'll do it. Stop it. That is sort of like what's already happening here. We're getting, not only are we getting these blue reflections from the sky, but we're also, just the color of beige that the dress is, is slightly cooler in the shadows than it is in these midtones. It's the same thing that's happening here to a slightly more exaggerated degree. And we want it to be exaggerated because we're going to be building on this and glazing. We're moving colors around, glazing stuff on top of it, and um, having this slightly exaggerated like temperature shift give a little bit more freedom to be able to build from. And that's really what I like to get out of the gradient map. And so it's not really doing a lot in terms of making it in color, but it is adding some properties of color to the overall thing. And then we can, um, you know, we can, if we wanted to add some local color, which we don't have a lot of here, but if we wanted to say like, give the dress like a little bit of or we can glaze that in with, uh, I like hard light for color glazing. 
going in. And uh, or let's uh, let's change it. Let's make it a make it a teal dress. And we can quickly glaze that in over the top. We don't even need to be that precise about it. And get a little bit of a tint. When we combine the gradient map with the tint that's coming in from the hard light, we end up with actually a lot of colors. Even though I've only added one color to this thing, there's actually a lot of colors in here. As you see, I've moved the eyedropper tool around. You can see that it's actually moving both on the axis of the outer color wheel, which means it's going from more blue to more green in different spots. As this thing starts to like wiggle back and forth. That, especially where it's moving up and down on the color wheel, that's a sign that we're getting different color temperatures in the shadows and the highlights. And that comes from the mixture of doing this blending mode. This is what it would look like if it was normal. Then the hard light gives it a little, wraps it into the, and then the gradient map gives it a little bit more color diversity. And we can do all kinds of different colors. We, because it's Photoshop, we can go in here and maybe move the color slider and decide that we want to go with, ooh, yellow over blue is always a very strong choice. Like that. And then the other thing I was thinking about adding a little bit of, and maybe we do this underneath the gradient here, is I might actually want to add some of these poofy clouds. Maybe I'll bang it in with some of my uh, sponge brush. And we could either do the clouds the way they are in the reference photo here, or we could make our own cloud pattern. You know, the great thing about clouds is that they're abstract. I, one of the things I like about clouds is that you can kind of have them flow along like the, the line of action. So we've got this like arrow of action coming up here, like, and so if we want to, we could have clouds that also flow in that direction. We kind of already are. One of the ways that I, I like to draw clouds sometimes is I just draw the edges of them with white. This is really easy to add over the top of stuff if you just need a quick little boost. Even with like a chunky square brush like this, you'd think this wouldn't look like fluffy soft clouds, but just give it a second. Because all you need to do is take, you have this top edge that, that remains kind of hard, and then you just take the bottom edge and you just kind of soften it up a little bit. And if you have that wiggly, in that wiggly bubbly line, and you soften it out like this, you can end up with these kind of like silhouetted cloud forms. really fast. Some of them I like making really, really thin, while other ones where they even like kind of break at the tips, while other ones they get deeper and form these like larger fluffy bits. And that variation between the shapes is what creates the dynamic interest. And 
And even if you were to follow this exactly the way I'm doing it, it would probably look a little different in your own hand because everyone kind of, in addition to seeing things different, they tend to also like naturally move their hand in a slightly different way. And that expression of the hand affects the look of the image as well. Go race away a little at the silhouette here so I get a nice clean silhouette, even though I'm painting on top. And you can see what I'm talking about. It's actually, we get this nice kind of surrealist cloudscape in the background here. Barely even worked for it. Oopsies. There we go. I'm always hitting the wrong keys. Three years of using Photoshop. Doesn't matter. Just hit the right keys afterwards. And then when we do the gradient map and everything on top of it, hey, we're in great shape. It's a good place to start. Again, we're kind of still looking roughly at this thing, but uh, you know, here we are at the point where we are going to start defining some more specific detail. Actually, we can do one more thing. Uh, I like to add a little bit of volume to stuff with a soft light. I am going to take this color and sort of soft light it over itself to reproduce a little bit of this like dark at the top, lighter at the bottom look that you get out of uh, sky. And I'm going to let it bleed over the figure a little bit. So I can kind of simulate a little bit of reflected light, get a little bit of value variation in the background so it's not one big flat tone. Soft light's really good for kind of building out these like softer, you can see how it just kind of focuses the light and builds out this uh, band of light through here, a little darker at the top, a little lighter through the middle. All right, fantastic. That was just a really quick walk. I'm getting us close to final on, this is where the gratification happens. We're gonna get in here and we're going to actually do the details on this and then we can even paint in some additional like hey we had some of these uh in hard light we might actually be able to she's got this red lipstick this is uh this is a cool effect so we can paint some of that in too and then maybe even there's some suggestion that she's got some red eye makeup as well that i think adds some uh interest here so put some of that in and that's just there not because it's going to stay there, but because we're going to push it around and we're going to have it there as like a tool to be able to kind of um, use. Yeah, this is cool. The way the pink at the edge of the skin tone, creating a little bit of a saturated edge there, adds uh, something that's a little different about the skin tone from the, from the dress. Once that gets all blended in, it's going to look pretty good. Okay, so here we are in our final detail layer. And uh, things don't look very close to final, but they are actually really close. This is so cool. I love this part. Came phone calls. We have like so much context, so much. We know like the values, we know the colors, we know generally where the placement of everything is. Now we just need to look a little bit more intensely at the details and we can start to push around the colors that are already here to be able to produce those final detailed little touches. And it does not... While I'm working on this, I'm able to take questions. So if we want to open up the floor, if anybody wants to raise their hand, go ahead and raise your hand, and I can answer any kind of questions for you. I can answer technical questions about Photoshop, painting questions, uh, talk about the uh, life of an artist, whatever you want to ask me. I'm available to you for the next one hour. We are one hour in, and we are doing fine. We're on the final layer already. So I got plenty of bandwidth to be able to talk. So we got some takers. Gallifrey, welcome. Good to see you. 
had myself muted. Hi, how you doing? Doing great. How about you? Well, pretty good. I wanted to hear more about your class. Like, how would somebody know if it's right for them? Like, what level does it start at? Um, I work with people who are at the very beginning of their art journey. Like, I had a guy who showed up, and um, I he, he had showed me a couple of drawings. I thought they were pretty good. They weren't blowing my mind, but they were pretty good. And then I got into the class with him, and, it, you know, it was a one-on-one -on -one thing. And I was like, uh, asking him some questions about stuff. And he, he was like, yeah, I don't know. I've never really done that much art. And I was like, how long have you been drawing? He's like, two months. Oh, wow. I'm like, <laughs> dude, I don't know if this is right for you. It's like a mentorship. Like this is really intended for people who are kind of further into their career. They're a little stuck, you know, like, um, like I don't want to have you not have this be worth your time and your money. Like it's expensive. Like I was charging... For one-on-one -on -one mentorships, it was like 600 bucks a month. Uh -huh. I'm like, are you sure you want to try? Because like it might be might be beyond you. Like, And he's like, no, 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 it's fine. Not really. Worth it. And like, you know, we'll work it out. It'll be fine. We'll give it a try. And it worked out great. And we had a great time. And um, so I was like, all right, well, for somebody who's got, I, I would say that the big factor is like, if you don't have a lot of time, it's not a good fit because I assigned a lot of homework. I sign usually about 15 to 20 hours worth of homework every week. Uh -huh. um, it's a lot. It's a lot, a lot. Um, and if you have time for that, it's fine. It's good. If you want if you want to be having conversations with somebody who's an expert every week and having tons of work, it'll be a good fit. And uh, if you want something that's like more casual, learn at your own pace, the, there's a lot of like, on-demand educational resources out there that's not what this is it's really like intended for somebody who is like wanting to have very direct feedback on what they're doing and that could be really like I, some of the people who have already signed up are one of the people who signed up as a creative director <laughs> at a game studio oh. uh, wow but i'm i i do anticipate that some people who are going to sign up for this are also going to be um probably beginners and I, it's like, it's designed to be a really small class. So everyone's going to get attention from, you know, time from me and they're going to be able to, you know, get some sort of personalized feedback and personalized assignments for where, what they, I think they need. Um, that's why it's so small. Cause it's really not supposed to be a, like, you know, it's really supposed to be about like, you know, a direct working relationship and not like a curriculum that's being, you know gone through like a beginner class or an advanced class it's um it's not the thing i think people stick with forever typically it's about a three-month process and at that point it tend the assignments tend to be kind of repetitive yeah um so it's like uh yeah and is it a, a photoshop only situation or um, I mean, I, I can give the best feedback with Photoshop. Oftentimes I am, I have assigned like traditional drawing to people. Uh, what do you typically work with? For well, Photoshop. <laughs> okay. yeah, but Photoshop. I, I had somebody asking me if you do regular traditional sketching kind of thing. Uh, traditional, I didn't like know. Pencil, pencil sketching. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I have some experience with that. It's really not so much about the medium. I don't do a lot of um, talk about technique so much it's a lot of like me trying to find the right references the kind of right workflows like i'm really trying to find out what is right for the student um what's happened a lot in the past with me doing one-on-one -on -one mentorships is somebody comes to me and asks like hey can you teach me how to draw like magic the gathering and i go like because most of the students that i've gotten are people that have styles that are very different from what magic the gathering typically does and so my goal is to always try to help them be the best version of themselves and um, give them an outsider's perspective, an expert perspective on like, hey, what are you good at? What should you be doing more of? What should you stop like, you know, kidding yourself about when it comes to the kind of style that you're trying to achieve or like what kind of jobs are you aspiring to get? And like, how should you be gear gearing your portfolio? Like it's the kind of thing, like sometimes when people do these, the uh, course is really, is all like, um, is done over video. 
but like mm -hmm. pre-recorded video where students are submitting homework and then the teachers are giving video critique. Uh, the mentorship that I'm doing is um, over live video because it's always a back and forth conversation. Uh, a lecturing them on showing them how to fix their work, but more about asking them questions and getting to know what their needs are. Um, because I don't feel like I can give appropriate feedback to someone without understanding where they're coming from. Yeah. Um, and so it's like, it's scheduled at a specific time, it, which is, I think, the biggest limiting factor. This class is going to be open on Thursdays at 9 a.m. Eastern, uh, in part to be able to accommodate people who are sort of uh, middle and eastern part of the U.S. as well as Europe. And then I'm going to expand to a late class for West Coast. You know, people who are like needing to work in the evening or meet in the evenings as well in the U.S. as well as West Coast. And then insane night owls from the U.K. perhaps That's as well. Cool. Um, we do have some of those here. <laughs> yeah, you know, I've I've done this on and off for 10 years. I've had students from all over the world and the times that we meet is like, very personal to the student, the same way that the kind of curriculum is. And um, I am always, always, always just trying to make sure that I get, I'm trying to push my my students in a direction that's going to um, serve their needs. Because I don't really, it's not that I need to protect myself from them copying my style or whatever. It's just that most people who come to me to learn aren't like on track to to look like mine. They tend, they tend to have their own personality and their own set of needs and their own natural style and stuff. And I really just want to like help them do the best with that. And, um, you know, I've had some really great results in the past. I've, I'm really proud of the results I've had from past, um, like individual mentorships. And then I'm hoping that the small group ones will have those same wins, but also have the added benefit of having there be like a, a number of students together to kind of also learn from you. That's the best way. I mean, it's it's like doing it, doing like this is when you go to college. You are in these like you're in a cohort, and um, I think having a community and a cohort can really make a huge difference as far as like how effective uh, you know an education is. And I'm hoping that like the small class sizes are a win 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 as far as like exposing more students to each other's work as well as like allowing the teachers it's not just gonna be me it's good i'm the first teacher in huckleberry but uh the plan is for me not to be the last one i want the, there to be more value for the teachers more value for the students hopefully out of the larger class sizes this first one is an experiment so this first month is actually being sold at a discount because it is a little experimental for me but yeah we'll we'll see i'm, I'm really hoping uh this is going to be a cool you know if it's a bad fit, I'll hopefully we'll suss that out early and, and make sure that nobody ends up paying for something that they don't want. Sounds good. You know, that blue wash you put over her face is picking up some of those turquoise artifacts in the reference. Uh-huh. Like magic. <laughs> it's like all the layers that I built up to this point are really there to try to create little happy accidents that are then going to be accessible to me at this like later step once I start getting precise about things. Um, and so you can sort of see like just this final layer, it's just like me adding a little bit of detail there. But like the detail couldn't have happened without having the underlying stuff kind of already prepared and laid out. This is a lot of like mise en place where I'm trying to like lay out all my utensils so I can cook fast. Yeah. <laughs> talking to you. I'll give the stage to somebody else, but I wanted to oh, hear more about your answer. class. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, uh, people were, were texting me and asking me, so I, and I didn't know the answer. So I came on to have you tell everybody. Ah, oh, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. Have a good day. You too. Hello. Hello. Derpadur, welcome back. Thanks. Yeah, I missed the last you i caught the, well i caught the very last like five minutes last one but um it's on your mind well 
I would first want to say it's noticeable your improvement over uh, with the studies because well, I think the last full uh, full session I caught was when was your first study. Oh yeah, <laughs> and what <laughs> yeah. difference now in how fast you're able to do it is? Uh, yes, yeah. I have been in the fucking lab trying to figure out how to like piece this together because like this is a challenge I've never taken on before and it's been experiment after experiment that's blown up in my face and now I feel like I'm finally I'm finally like gotten a process together and so now it's time to like now I'm gonna take I'm taking a little victory lap and then I'm going to be um going back into the lab do more experiments because it's been really fast I feel like it's been about a couple of months and I and I've built like a whole new skill set for myself. It's been awesome. It's so fun to learn yeah. this quickly. Because I remember you gave me a tip on how to do gradations of lighting, kind of like you're doing right now. But that initial step with the um, using like the airbrush to do like bulk lighting, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> bulk. <laughs> bulk buying the lighting to get it cheap yeah. at Costco. <laughs> anyway, I just wanted to say. Great work on the improvement. Thank you. It's an inspiration to see how fast, like if you can do that in two months, then in a year. Oh yeah. I didn't prove that much. A bunch of people have been doing dailies along with me at uh, Huckleberry, but only a handful of them have actually done like 60 of them over the past 60 days. And um, I haven't been perfect about doing them every single day, but I have, I think it's been about um, 65 of eight days or maybe a little bit, you know, maybe 65 over 75 days, something like that. Uh, so it's like it, it's been an exercise in trying to avoid perfection while also trying to remain consistent. And like that balance has been an interesting part of the experiment as well. But yeah, I, I really hope that like people's takeaway from this is that, hey, this guy is supposedly an expert and yet he's, I'm like, like, I guess there's a, the, the average age in here is pretty, uh, but like I'm turning 40 next month and I'm right. learning a brand new skill set and it's going pretty quick, which I'm hoping helps inspire people to take their own jump. If they're like a little bit later in life and they think maybe it's passed them by, I encourage you to reconsider. I've met plenty of artists who have started late in life. You can start from zero and get pretty dang far in six months to a year. If you are, you know, if you got the time for it and you got the interest in it. Yeah. You can bust these out. You can blast through it, especially if you're like, you know, if you're a little older, you got a little confidence in your, um, in your taste, your personality. Yeah. It's like way easier than like college kids who are like constantly nervous about looking cool in front of others and stuff. <laughs> yeah. Life does get easier once you get past that phase. Yeah. Of letting go a little bit and just like not not being so concerned about being cringe, you, you it liberates you to be yourself a little more. And um, a, a big part of art's emotional labor, and I think it just it's gotten easier for me as I've gotten older to just be more serious about this sort of stuff and uh, a little bit more considered. And um, that's been a real superpower. It's been great. All right. Well, I'll pass it over to somebody else, but. All right. Well, thanks for showing up. I appreciate the compliment. I, I'm glad to. Um, I, I I gotta tell you, I'm I'm fucking loving these studies in part because like, I, getting to see my own progress in this is like revitalized my love of art in a big way. It is so satisfying to uh, to like learn a skill and get better at it. It's one of the reasons I'm out here trying to evangelize for you guys. <laughs> All right. Thanks. All right. See you. Yeah, so now I'm just like taking some of this background color and you can see as I'm washing it and over the top, it's creating this illusion of being transparent. Everything in, everything in pain is an illusion, ultimately. It's all a special effect. Um, but, you know, since we already built up all of the volume here and we already have like this background color well established, um, all I need to do is a little bit of sampling and a little bit of pushing things around and all of a sudden we have what feels a lot like, uh, you know, a transparent thing. And then I want to get some of these crusty looking, um, crusty in a good way, like crusty sourdough bread 
looking flowery bits on the dress. So I'm going to take this crusty brush and just start hitting some of this in this like floor and like kind of a loose spirally way. And look at that. We're like Bob Ross in our way through this and, and putting happy little trees on the dress. It's, it's super easy. Um, again, just because we have all the underlying stuff underneath it, it's making this kind of final surface level detail basically automatic, which is very fun to do. Yeah, I remember being so frustrated on that first one, just going like, man, can't believe I got on stage to embarrass myself like this and having such a hard time. <laughs> and now it's like, I'm feeling like I'm in command of this thing. And, oh, it feels so good. Uh, doesn't look like we have anybody else waiting on stage. I can keep talking about the way I'm painting this, but if you want to pop up and ask any questions, it doesn't need to be an advertisement for my class or whatever. It can be, you know, if you're curious about this or like, what are you where to get started? Um, you just want to ask about something art related. doesn't need to be related to this painting. You're welcome to come up here and yeah, there were like three people there, and as basically as soon as I clicked them to come up, they dropped. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Oh, Doctuary, hello, hello, welcome. Hi, um, I've been actually having trouble finding a job in the last few months in the industry, mm -hmm. in like games, entertainment, that sort of thing. Can you um, give me your perspective on what's happening right now? Because it seems like a lot of people I know are out of jobs. Um, well, I mean, you're looking at uh, what, what was the... There's a bunch of companies that were expanding a lot over the last several years. Uh, I think you, you look at something like what's happening with like Embracer Group. Do you know what I'm talking about? Do you know what Embracer should, Group um, I've heard that name before. I think a Swedish conglomerate or something like that, that were buying up a lot of IP and studios uh, for the last like oof, uh, 10 years almost. And they're like, nobody knows who they are, but they if you look up Embracer Group uh, and you find their Wikipedia article, you'll see that they like own a shitload of big name studios. And then like they were just about to try to get like a multi-billion dollar funding deal from like the Saudi government and it fell through. And now they're in a cash crunch and they're selling off Gearbox. It's like dumb shit like that where it's like uh, companies, large companies are buying up lots of smaller companies. So they have been for a long time, especially when uh, the interest rate was low and it was like cheap to borrow lots of money. People were using, companies were using that as an excuse to buy up lots of smaller companies. And a lot of those mergers were resulting in people. Uh, and like, this isn't a complete explanation of what's going on, but I can tell you it's definitely part of it. Is that like a lot as like borrowing money was cheap and people were spinning up lots of projects and stuff, there was lots of hiring going on. And then after like inflation started to hit following 2020 um the cost of borrowing money went up and a lot of these people a lot of these companies that were depending on like constant growth started to see some faltering in some of their numbers and have like downsized like they've downsized their like overall growth strategy they've like stopped acquiring so many studios they've started trying to sell off assets and you know, as anything, any of their products underperform, they're like cutting loose the lower performing um, studios and assets and stuff. And it's like, if in freezes in hiring, it's resulting in closures of studios. And it's not like hitting everybody universally, but it certainly is being felt kind of across the industry. Um, the fact it's happening kind of concurrently with the rise of AI, I think is like entirely coincidental, but people do like to point to AI as a reason why there is like a fewer jobs in the game and entertainment industry right now. Uh, but I don't buy that as like a complete narrative. I think the cost of borrowing money in the sort of like contraction phase of this like acquisition and like the sort of like wave of acquisitions that we had been experiencing back when borrowing money was like super cheap 
I think that this was just an inevitable part of the kind of capitalistic cycle that has been like quietly pushing in the background, you know? Um, yeah, I kind of suspected it was like a greater financial thing rather than something like the strike or AI. I... Yeah, I mean, the strike isn't really affecting games. I mean, it's like it, it, movie productions have definitely slowed down. So I'm sure anybody who's working concept art I don't know if it's actually hit as far as concept art yet because I know productions have had to slow down or stop because of um, the actor strike, but stuff that's in pre-production before it like hits an actor, like should still be like having concept artists work on it. Cause the concept artist union in movies has not struck. I mean, they have one and they are not striking, so they can theoretically still do work on films without the actors or writers. Thank you. I, I I don't work in that specifically. I just listen to a lot of financial news and I know people that work in the industry, so that's my best guess. So don't take it as gospel, please. I am the man. All right. Thank you. A one of only average intelligence. Yeah, I've I've seen some people who are like doomsaying about um, the game industry because uh, they were definitely seeing some contraction in jobs, and they were worried that it was maybe like just going to be like this forever and constantly get worse because AI was taking all the jobs. But I don't know what just because I don't see any evidence that that's happening. Art Maker sixty four, how's it going? Can you hear me? Yes, you're coming through fine. Oh, I just wanted to say that face is fucking sick. Thanks, man. It didn't take much once I got everything kind of planned out, right? Right. But I did have a quick question, though. Sure. Uh, when it comes down to, like, drawing and hand paint and stuff like that, it's like I'm not really good with, like, anatomy and all that other stuff. So since I started using uh, Mid Journey, I kind of started, like, in Mid Journey now more than my own painting. Mm-hmm. Now, should that mean I should stop painting since I kind of focus more on digital art? Or should I just, like, I'm kind of stuck in the bind? Well, you know, one of the things about art is that there's not really a should. Now, when you're saying should when it relates to art, you're probably making some kind of mistake. Yeah. Um, I mean, not to say specifically, anytime anybody says should to me in one of these conversations, I always get, I always, like, throw up a yellow card. Um, I mean, man, like, what do you want to do? Game making, game making, painting, anything that deals with like anything artistic is what I want to okay. do. Like, skills and drawing is like, uh, yeah, I mean, drawing is like, I, you know, for a long time, I thought of drawing as sort of a means to an end because I was like, well, I want to make these characters or I want to make this you know, IP. Mm -hmm. And so I need to be able to draw in order to be able to make that happen. Right. And then right. Um, over time, I found that like the real power of drawing was in just enjoying the process of it. Mm -hmm. so I would say like, if you want to make games, like I would just do whatever it takes to make the games. And mm -hmm. if you want to make drawings, I would say just make the drawings and don't worry about how it all adds up and adds together. Like See, that's, that's the part that holds me back is like, I come up with a whole bunch of game ideas, write them out, and got them all ready. And just like, I forgot his name, I just left, but I'm also looking for people to do games with as well. But at the same time, I feel like I'm lacking in the, in the drawing state. Uh, well, you know, um, one of my favorite games for the last couple of years, Vampire Survivors, was made entirely with placeholder art. And that game sold millions of copies. Oh, wow. It's like, um, you know, you really don't need drawing skills in order to make games, I don't think. Uh, you know, in a lot of cases, people will do, uh, will design their games and, and build the gameplay without, um, with mock-up art, you know, stuff that you can get off marketplaces or for free off the internet, just right. to prove out gameplay and prove out their ideas. 
And then if you have very specific art needs that you want to layer on top of it, you know, you can be uh, collaborating with artists that share your vision. If you have like a functioning game that like people mm -hmm. really cool that you were really proud of and you want to take to the next level, it, I mean, you should be able to like figure out ways of bringing more people in, getting them involved. I think. Oh yeah, I got a, I got a crap load. I just don't have no people to mute with about it. That's my only okay. problem. So are you looking to like find more people to work with or are you just mm. hoping to do the whole thing yourself? No, I won't. I want to work with other people. I just don't know anybody. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, networking in the game industry, it's like, um, you know, people, they tend to find each other on social media a lot these days, you know, posting bits about what their game, their games on, um, on Twitter mm -hmm. and whatever. Mm -hmm. And they follow each other. Like one of the strategies I've, I've, I've been advising a few artists who are just trying to get their name out for the first time. And what I tell them is like, go on Twitter and find a bunch of people that do the kinds of things that you really love. And then start commenting a lot on all their posts. <laughs> Cause most creative people don't actually get that many people commenting on their posts and like DMing them and saying, Hey man, I love what you do. And if you genuinely feel that way about that stuff, it's not going to come across as a cool play for attention. It's going to be you. Right really talking to someone else that you about something that you think is really that you really care about and then um when you are also posting your own stuff for your own game they're going to notice that because they're going to follow you back and they're going to go damn this guy's up to some cool shit they're going to like you know retweet you and like share your work and like help expose you to even more people to their own audience as well and i've seen this work to an incredible effect with other illustrators and i've seen i follow a bunch of the game devs uh, indie game devs on Twitter too. And really? I see their progress all, all the time. And I know they follow each other and they get a sense of like a community through online spaces like that. They hang out in Discord servers together. It's um it's all doable. It's not like a secret society that you need to like know the right people or whatever. It's an open door for anybody who's really passionate about this sort of stuff, I think. Okay. And I, I had another question I'm gonna pass to sure. somebody else. Um like, do you basically just use Mid Journey to see if you can like remaster it in a way, or do you also use Mid Journey as a, a kind of like an art medium? Uh, I didn't use Mid Journey at all in this case. This is just a photo I found on Pinterest. I think it's been photo manipulated. It's probably a photo that was taken and then manipulated by the photographer. Uh, oh. That's why it looks weird. I mean, it's got a crazy looking face and it's very unrealistic, but. I don't think it's AI actually. I think I'd had it in my folder longer than AI's existed. Okay. Well, I don't know what I'm server here, awesome. but uh, you know, I'm I'm really focused on just like um, traditional learning, uh, learning and teaching uh, traditional ways of making images, and um, and yeah. So sometimes I start off with an AI reference, but in this case, I don't think it is. Well, keep doing what you're doing, man, because this is Thank awesome. You. You can see like, um, you know, I'm just kind of scraping away at all these little details here. I'm just trying to follow my nose as to like what feels like it's important in terms of um, like uh, reproducing the effect of the painting here. We have lots of these little wiggly lines and like creases and stuff. But you can see that because we have the underlying structure already there, just this one little coat of paint over the top of it starts to produce like these very textures almost instantly without a lot of work. You know, I've been. I got to here about a half hour ago, so I'm like most of the way down through the figure, and I'm already at um uh, just a half hour later. Uh, some of these other bits down here, instead of going in with these little tiny wiggly lines with this brush, I might actually be able to get a lot of effect by using like the lasso tool. Lasso tool is really good at creating a really hard edge, crunchy look, just kind of like wiggling selection. And then as I close it back out up here, I take a big brush, just hit the whole dang thing. And you can see we can start to get some crunchy, crunchy marks like that. I have it mapped to the, um, I have the L button mapped to my um, tablet. There's a little button on the stylus of my pen, little pen stylus here. And so I can just hold that down and it goes straight over to the lasso tool. I can start to get these little wiggly marks. Lasso tool is the, Second 
coolest tool in Photoshop behind the paintbrush, in my opinion. So I want to have quick access to it because I always want to be able to do a little lasso in every once in a while. You can see that's starting to fill in some of these like viney effects very, very quickly without having to do too much. Point is really to create the effect of the thing and not the thing itself. You can even do a little up here, build on top of what we've already made. And then I'm gonna probably paint a little bit more into some of these folds. Cause like these folds are really like hot, contrasting and dimensional. And I think I wanna bring some of that out. Um, and in this case, I'm gonna be doing it maybe over some of these like uh, high contrast like details here. I don't know if you heard me, but I said, thanks for the tip. Oh yeah, I didn't hear you. Th thanks for coming on stage, man. It's good talking to you. You too. Man. Gonna get these legs rendered in really fast. There's not much to it. This little blotch of paint, need to smush it around. It's other knees in almost total shadow. And then there's just a little bit of light coming up over the calf here. Doesn't take a lot. There we go. And then I wanna cut the line of the dress a little tighter because I think it look, would look cool with. Uh, Nice sharp edge here. One of the things I like to do in a study like this is actually uh, intentionally lose some of the edges. So let's see, we got, we can start to um, sculpt the hip here a bit, get it a little bit more in line with where this reference looks like. Just got this, uh, you know, wide round hip here. It looks really cool when she's kicking it out get that edge sculpted. And like we can also exaggerate a little bit by losing some of these edges. So like taking that color from the background and sort of smushing it over the figure like this. One of the other things that I am known for is creating these smudge effects where I take some of the brighter colors and I just make a vertical smudge off the top of them. And then I blend it in with the background color just a little bit. These kinds of like lost edge smudges are really just a stylistic effect that I like to do to um, bring in a little bit of extra energy into the piece, add a little bit of artistic flair. So between like picking some areas where the edges are going to disappear, especially along longer, straighter, more boring parts, uh, as well as like picking some of these brighter areas to create these vertical smudges on, I get this like a little bit more artsy painterly sense to it. It's basically freestyle points. And I'll cash those in whenever I can get them. Hey there. It's hey, Lulu. Lulu. How you doing? Doing good. How about you? Pretty good. Um, what you're doing just kind of made me think of something. Yep. Um, so it's a guilty pleasure. I really like the movie Stardust. Stardust. His name. Uh, uh, oh man, I can like picture the actors mm -hmm. and it's like escaping me. Robert De Niro is in it. Yes, yes. And Claire Danes. Claire Danes, yeah. Um, so th there was an effect like, you know, when she's really, really happy mm -hmm. and her, and she started to glow. And then, like, the, like, there was a, a certain way that her skin, like, her, her, as she radiated, that was different than any other movie I've ever, ever seen. Cool. And I spent probably a couple of days in Photoshop trying to mimic that effect. Um, so I'm just curious. Have you ever, like, seen something in a movie or a work of art or something anywhere and thought wow that's really cool how do i mimic that because like, i do the same thing with food like if i really like a dish oh, at a restaurant i figure out how to cook it you know like and then try to try to emulate it um 
so do you do that the same thing, you know, the same thing with like special effects, how you can incorporate that in your art, maybe to do something different that, that you hadn't done before, or just like, is that like 100%. a puzzle that you'd like to solve? You, you are totally nailing it. Like that is exactly what I do in a lot of cases. Like actually one of the way I, I credit law and order as like teaching me how to do lighting. Cause that'd be like, Oh wait, three point lighting that they do in like for procedures is actually like, you know, when you start to analyze it, it's like a really simple way of like learning how like basic lighting setups go. But also yeah. like um, I would see stuff in movies and TV and I would be like, oh, that's a cool effect. And I'd be try to reproduce it in my own way. I was just thinking of an example and it is, it's escaping me. I'm, I'm, I have done two studies today and at, towards the end of this broadcast, my brain starts to sag a little bit. Um, Like, oh, that's so cool. I'm going to steal that. I'm going to do that next time. And that is, that is like, I think how I've built a lot of my stylistic notes is just by stealing little, lots of little bits here and there from all of my favorite things from like comics and video games and movies and television. And it's all kind of accumulated into a kind of creative mush that I then, you know, I'm pulling back out of. I'm like, my own taste is going to be slightly different than everybody's. And so like the sorts of things that I steal and like what I do with them is going to be different than, you know, the, per any other person. And so I, I credit like that kind of creative stealing as being like the source for where my style comes from. Aside from the thing I was talking about earlier, where it's like, you know, this kind of like compression errors that you get from um, trying to, to the compression errors that you get from like trying to process all the details of visual information, having them kind of copy wrong. Um, the other part is like the, there is the intentional half of it where it's like you trying to reproduce your favorite dish at home yes. by like tasting very carefully for the flavors and like thinking about what the preparation is going to be. And like, you know, um, when I was first getting started in pain, like all I was doing was looking at, Or in real life, looking at like people and looking at like sunsets and clouds in the sky. And other times it was like something I would see in a movie or like a certain drawing style that I wanted to replicate. And um, yeah, and then like that's, I'd like never quite turn it off. Like I, I've, anytime anything like really strikes me, something unique about the way somebody's doing color or contrast or lighting or something i'm trying to take these little mental notes so i can bring them back to like play around with them yeah well um, it, it's i think it's it, people that are in general you know whether it's drawing or cooking or you know like photography um you tend to see the world through a different set of eyes you know like um because yeah. i like didn't do that before i started drawing it was yeah. only after i started drawing that i started doing that and it was it's, like that ever to the world mm -hmm. like that that like desire to consider like the visual world all the time whether it was in media or in real life added a layer of interest and like a layer of complexity to the world that has like never left me and it's it's transformed the look of everything i've ever seen since and i would never go back it's so much the world is so much more interesting having studied art yeah um so i just put a link in the um the vc text mm -hmm. so this was a i don't know if any if everybody can see it it's a, it's a Flickr a picture let me see if i can find it i can pull it up on screen so everyone can see it then oh that'd be cool but i would need to actually find where that vc text is there you go there so uh, so this was a friend of mine and i've put in the comment Mm -hmm. So if you scroll down, you'll see the original picture. It It's probably slow to load, or maybe you can't if you're not a member. I don't know how Flickr works for everybody. So I was like just listening to um, some music on, on YouTube, and it would ha have like flashes of pictures, right, as mm -hmm. it was going on. Some goth music, because, you know, that was my hot topic, <laughs> my hot topic days. Hell yeah. Um, and... 
I saw a really cool picture. It was like of a girl. She had like her hair covering half of her face and it had this really cool lighting. It was like, you know, like the, the, the blue and pink cast. Um, and I just took a picture that I already had, that one. And I spent about four hours. I stayed on until like, I don't know, three o'clock in the morning, just taking it, that one thing into Photoshop and just like highlighting the hair, cropping the face, doing the, um, like almost changing the structure of the face with like dodging and burning. And, mm -hmm. um, and it's just, it's like I, it's almost like I went into a trance and just did it. And I've never been able to do another picture like that. It's, it's really cool when you just <laughs> let your subconscious just like take over. Yeah. There's and parts it, of your, there's parts of you that you don't have control of that. If you let them take over, they do amazing things. Yeah. And, it, and then you look at it and you go, damn, was I involved in this? I, I know I was yeah. there, but was I, but was, am I, do I get to take credit for what just happened? Does that happen to you a lot? Do you just like go into that zone where you just kind of like let it um, happen? To some degree all the time. Like, oh, damn, hell yeah. I get to take credit for this. I'm ha I, when I'm happy with a painting, I always feel a little bit of like, I thought, I mean, I was putting in the work. I was trying to do all the things, you know? I had a plan. I was executing on the plan. I was thinking about what I needed, but I didn't have the whole thing in my head at once. And so when I stand back and I look at it and it all like works, I just, I feel so grateful because I know I wasn't, even if I was there for every choice, I know I wasn't there for the whole thing. Like the, the accumulation of all of it together always feels like it's a bit magical. Yeah, so that doesn't get old, even though you've been doing this for a long time, you still get that like thrill. I mean, I, there was a conversation last week about like, hey, do you ever get bored of AI? Uh, and I'm like, I, just... <laughs> and I was like, I don't know. Um, I don't get bored of making art. It's that that thrill of like it being a little out of control all the time. I think adds to why I, I have never gotten sick of art. It's because like it's um. It's like I, I'm, I, you know, I'm not always in total command of everything. Like a certain part about it is like, you know, automatic or a little bit spiritualistic. It's like, you know, there's people talk about a muse, you know, to explain mm -hmm. the sensation of like, yeah, there was another force that was acting on this besides my own because we don't, when we're doing it right, when we're being creative, uh, effectively like we don't feel like we did everything yeah you know um even if we made all the choices we don't remember making all the choices and we don't consciously do all of them and there's there's parts of ourselves that is non that are non-verbal that only to express themselves through our actions and not through a narrative of like, and now I'm going to do this. And this right. is what I hope is going to happen. Like you get this feeling of being kind of compelled to make a choice and you allow that, that compulsion to rise to the surface and take action. And then you see the result and you go, damn, whoever that was, was smart. <laughs> <laughs> and like, you know, he, he, and it, it's, it's a, it's a very interesting, very powerful feeling that um, I think anybody who's done creative work relates to. And you hear people talk about it in just about every medium. Uh, it's a very, very well-known human experience that transcends like all cultures and time. And there's all kinds of different myths and myth, myth making around it that explains, that tries to explain or, or just describe that feeling. And it's great. And um, I, I can't imagine done that sometimes like it's awesome yeah I, I think um having the different tools now where you can kind of let that happen like if you have a vision and and maybe can't draw I, I know you know that if this is learned anybody could probably pick this up at some point if they keep practicing I know that you you value that a lot but 
you know, some people don't feel like they'll ever have the kind of skill to, to visualize something and actually make it happen. And that's why AI is so important to them. And now we've got, um, you know, different functions within mid journey where something didn't come out like you wanted it and you just keep fiddling around with it mm -hmm. until, until it feels right. You know, that what you wanted to see. Um, I just love that there's so yeah. many different things out there right now. And, um, you know, I think that if people get that feeling at first from working with mid journey and it starts to fade over time, I encourage them to continue to chase it in more manual aspects of art. Cause yep. like that feeling is, I think stronger with, um, I mean, I've definitely gotten a feeling of excitement over creating using AI, but I, I get that feeling so much stronger from painting. Yeah. And well, like, you, you do most of the work. <laughs> so. well, well, yeah. It, but also it's like, I don't know, there's something about the sort of pace of it, the slow pace and like the progressive cadence of it. And like, um, the really direct involvement and the crazy mention that you have to put into it in order to like make it come together it all uh, it all comes together to make a um an experience that um is very very satisfying and does not get old easily yeah well you know in some ways you're you're a creator just you know on many levels you're putting something into existence that wasn't there before and mm -hmm. um you made it I think that's a very thing. I mean, I've got proof that I made it, I think. I, again, like I'm looking <laughs> over this thing and when I tune out a little bit, I like like kind of like wake up and I go, dang, these clouds are weird looking in a way that I'm appreciating. Like I know I had said, oh, and then I do these things, this you make these kinds of marks, and then you get these weird clouds and you wouldn't think it would work, but it does. And I was also I was also crossing my fingers a little bit, like, damn, I sure hope this works. <laughs> I'm crossing my thing. I'm like saying out loud, oh yeah, yeah, this will work. I really am just like, dang, I really hope this works. Cause like sometimes, you know, the muse is there and sometimes the muse isn't. Yeah. Um, but also like sometimes like the effects that you get from some of these art techniques really works better than other times without a clear explanation as to like why. And so when it, it you, when you just move your hand and like, things start to appear that you did not expect that surprise you as the creator that feels awesome that's like that's the that's the feeling that i feel like i'm always chasing is like wondering what is behind the next door if i keep asking for the next one yeah how much of that is like i you teach techniques you teach um you know a, a lot of, of people to become really good artists and how much of it is technique and how much of seeing what happens. It doesn't have to be a good balance between both. It is, it is a balance. Like the thing I think that I'm, I'm often a teacher of is getting, giving people the structure to spend more time making art and then doing a little bit of time analyzing how that time went. But like the thing that I think people screw up a lot is like, they're waiting for the secret knowledge to appear. Like they're waiting for a tutorial that's going to teach them something fantastic that's new and exciting or a tool that is going to like change their perspective on how they create some sort of like new insane thing is going to happen. And what I've helped, the way I've helped people unlock a lot of their creativity is really just by going like, okay, now we're going to make five paintings this week. And then we're going to look at them and talk about how we feel about them. A lot of, you know, there's a lot of, <laughs> if this classroom full of high school students, it'd be all groans, you know? <laughs> oh, oh God, really? That's what we're going to be doing this week? What a fucking bummer. Like, draw a lot and then talk about how we feel about it. Like, that has got to be the most annoying way to, like, spend a week. But artists who are paying me a lot of money for, you know, mentorship. We do that together. They go with me on faith. And then 
a couple of months of that, they go, dang, I cannot believe what's coming out of me. And I don't teach them about art technique that much, very little often. Many times I'm working with students who are working with art techniques that I don't really know myself. And so I don't actually teach them the techniques. It's a lot of like, hey, we're gonna spend the time. We're gonna talk about your relationship with the work. We're gonna talk about your relationship with the reference that you use and all that you know, combined time adds up to some, you know, the result that is surprising to everyone involved, like to me and to the artists themselves. Um, and it's, it, I, it, it's like even people who have spent a lot of time, like gone through, done art college, graduated, struggled to find a job, you know, you would think they would be like, have spent the hours necessary to do that. But there's, be just like that extra time of like work of how that time went in a guided sort of way um, adds up for some reason. I'm not entirely sure why, but it, it keeps working. But it's really it's really not a matter of like, uh, let me show you how to use the paintbrush a certain way. Like I did that a little bit today. And like, it's kind of cool because I'm studying technique right now. And so that kind of stuff, there is technique that can arise as like a, a lesson, but it's really not the core thing. I never studied technique throughout all the years I was learning to become a professional artist. Didn't need to. Wow. And it's not because I'm smart. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> I don't think it's, I don't think that's the core thing that artists do. Yeah. Well, a lot of people will say if you go to like um, culinary school or music school, or, you know, whatever type of school, you learn their way of doing things and mm -hmm. instead of learning it your own way. Um, so they say sometimes education will ruin you. It'll take the the thing out of you that you had. Um, so I guess balance is a, is a really good thing. I love how you're making that image look like your work. It It looks like, you know, it has that feel of your art, even though yeah. you're referencing something else. That's why I'm, that's why I'm getting really happy with the studies is because at first, like I'm trying, I was trying to kind of add creative flares to make it. So I was like a imperfect copy machine. Mm -hmm. And then over time I'm accumulating like a method of um, having it feel like it's my work. Like, I really feel like I understand how to make it feel like mine and um that was like the thing i felt like i was really missing i wasn't sure people do studies and i would say like dang and have it look like the thing but in a way that feels cool and creative and personal mm -hmm. and i wanted that and i didn't understand how to do it and so i spent a couple months fucking with it and i'm starting to get it I still have a long way to go. I can do way better than this. Like the feeling that I have now is that I've like figured out one thing and I've laid down like one coat of paint and I'm, and I'm, I know I can do more and I'm excited to continue to push and do more. This is, this didn't take that long to learn. Um, I mean, let's look at this. Let's like go back to the, to the thing. Look at that first one again. The first one's not that good. <laughs> <laughs> this took me two hours, like barely scraped in at two hours. I think I was finished with this thing 10 minutes ago. And it's so much more complicated and it's so much more expressive. And we can peel it back. Like, let's take a look. Let's peel this back and take a look at it again from like back to front. Run it back to the beginning. Wow. These early steps, super doable for a beginner right yeah. not precise not clever it's real it's just like functional what are the basic shapes let's get them mostly right let's not get too precious and not to spend too much time i was lassoing stuff and moving it around it's smudgy it's rough whatever blocking in flat anyone can do this blurry airbrush uh, i could give this to a child easy outlining in a solid color nothing takes nothing <laughs> and then like rough value block like rough roughly kind of cut, cutting in loose shapes this is where 
think the average adult would probably spend a decent amount of time kind of fussing and struggling and kind of pushing things back and forth and feeling unsure. And this is where the difficulty starts to come in. But, um, you know, I'm trying to stay loose and unprecious, doing something very similar with the background, loose and unprecious, general, expressive, a little bit of color magic, a little bit more color magic, but like still imprecise and being on what feels right. A little bit more magic, a little blending mode. Again, focusing on the feel, the vibe without really worrying about the detail. And then we have one layer left. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is what the layer looks like in isolation. It's a ton of little tiny brush strokes that uh -huh. I would never would have been able to place unless I had all of those preliminary steps laid in advance. Yeah, but it's still like the whiteboard with the physics. And then he has at the end of the equation and then magic happens. And then magic happens. <laughs> yeah, that last detail layer at the top <laughs> is like currently carrying a lot of water. You know, yeah. um, but it's like every brush stroke on it was like an incremental upgrade from this, which was not complicated to build. It's not complicated, not precise. Um, you learn a couple of things about Photoshop, a little bit, and it's otherwise, you know, whatever. And then everything else is you go in with a little brush and you just scrape, scrape, scrape. And I spent about a, a 30 to 40 minutes on it. And that's all it took. Cause I mean, as an expert, 30, 40 minutes, all I needed. I think that if I get better with my process, as I continue to layer more learning on top of this, I think I could probably make a better version of one of these at the same, not faster. Mm -hmm. And then it would be fewer brush strokes to get to something that is more refined and nicer looking than this. And you so I think I could cut both of these, both the, the, the halfway point to this down. I get, ha I get this in 30 minutes instead of an hour. And I think I can get this in 15 minutes instead of a half hour. And I think I could get the whole process. I bet you I could get in a couple of years, I think I could get this down to 20 minutes. Oh, it's possible. Well. Well, just remember the movie, the menu, don't the eat, menu. savor. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, the process of doing this is still so fun to me right now, especially because it's like, I feel like I'm learning a lot. And so I'm really savoring the time that I'm spending working on it. And like, that's been a big part of what keeps drawing me back to here. But also the mastery part of it has been very enticing to keep coming back to. Um, it's beautiful. Yeah. No, you're right. It's savoring it really is a huge part of this whole thing. And so, yeah, very happy to have been able to share this with you guys today. I think we're yeah. at the end of this uh, the session. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining me. Thanks, everyone, who brought it, came on stage. Thanks, HU Chaos, for putting up with uh, sitting through this every week. And um, I'm going to be back again next Tuesday, like I always am, and uh, look forward to it. So um, I'll see you guys then. Have a good one. Oh. You too. It was great talking to you again. Bye, Lulu. Bye-bye.